So, Scott, could you tell us a wee bit about who you are and also how you got into the career that you're currently doing? So I am a TV critic and broadcaster, and that involves uh, talking about and reviewing TV on both radio and um, uh, written down in sort of various newspapers and ma magazines. And I kind of fell into it, I think, like a lot of careers do, kind of by accident. I have always loved TV. I think it's always been such a fantastic part of my life. Um, so many shows that I love to talk about. And then when I left university, I would occasionally write about shows I'd really enjoyed the previous night. Um, and then I started to pitch to different editors. And then eventually I got a couple of columns going. And then it just became a bigger and bigger part of my life. Um, and then I um, started a job at uh, the company BuzzFeed. And then that involved writing about, you know, Bake Off and Strictly. And then um, I then got picked up by BBC Radio 5 Live and they have a slot where on Mondays I just review shows that are on during the previous week. So it's, um, so, so it's you know, I really enjoy it. It's very unpredictable. Um, there's always a lot to talk about because I find that TV is a fascinating insight into so many different issues in our society. Um, but um, it doesn't involve me being a lot watching TV in my living room, <laughs> not going out as much as I would like. <laughs> what a wonderful job, though. I mean, it couldn't get any better, really. I mean, I often think a teacher is the best job in the world, but you get paid to watch TV. I think yeah, a little win. bit, a little bit. I mean, <laughs> the weird thing about it is that, like, when I try to have time off, I then watch TV, and then that kind of goes, oh, I could write about that, or I'll start typing about this. So it's work-life balance is a little bit yeah, and what did you do at university? I did politics, um, quite a bit different than I <laughs> thought I was going to be, because um, I, I just got into the student societies there, so I got really into student radio, there's a lot of great um, student radios across the country, um, I did one called URY, and then there's also great student papers as well, so I did one called York Vision, and I think it's, that's like a great side of going on to uh, university if you decide to do so is the student activities and the societies you can get stuck into and I just sort of felt like it was a you know it's, it's an opportunity to sort of try things out you wouldn't normally do mm -hmm. yeah, so, good stuff. yeah so obviously we've got along today because this week in Scotland is Dyslexia Awareness Week Scotland and we know that from reading your, your social media and things you've, you've spoken uh, about being dyslexic. When was it that you first became aware that you kind of had dyslexia and if this was either during school time or slightly later, did that make school a bit of a challenge for you? Yes it did. I mean I found out that I was um, dyslexic at the age of 20 um, and um, it made me aware when I was told that I had issues all throughout my education. It's like all, all of it made sense all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So so basically I have always been, um, could, the, every person who is dyslexic has dyslexia in a different way. Like and there's no, like um, there's no sort of uh, exact way to be dyslexic if that makes sense. So essentially I have always been quite good at uh, spelling. My spelling has normally been actually, you know, quite um, good. Um, I can um, uh, read okay, my sentence structure is okay, but the difficulty that I've had is expressing myself in writing. It's been really hard, and also with reading, I can read maybe a few pages, but if I get to a chapter of a book, for example, at the end of that chapter, I cannot remember what I've just read. It just goes in and out. So throughout school, those issues were always present. Like I would always get told by teachers, um, I would be a bit muddled, I'd be a bit sloppy, um, I could not use a comma ever, like I could, I didn't know how to use one, yeah. so yeah. There, I would submit essays and like literally be the longest sentences you've ever read in your entire life, just like you'd have to breathe in, um, yeah. but I was always told like, you know, I think all throughout my school, it was the assumption that I was just a bit sloppy and I needed to like hone in the skills a little bit more, but I was having to put in more and more efforts. It was only really when I got to uni and I did politics and yep. I had to write uh, out essays and submit essays. And you have to really be good at conveying an argument. And when I was writing down, like it, it only made sense to me what I was writing. 
but to anyone else they look at it and be like <laughs> they, would be, they would be really confused and then um it was only by a friend um called uh tilly who is dyslexic herself she had one look on my essay and went oh wow you need to go and actually get tested and 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 um and be told and then immediately you know they they said that that you know every dyslexic's different but i'm kind of in the middle so there's like you know there's 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 um uh people who are less dyslexic who um might not even know that they are dyslexic okay. and then there are people who are who, who are more severely so that's why i'm sort of quite in in the middle and just being told that mm -hmm. um was a real comfort because i think yeah. people think that when you get told it's like oh my word but actually nothing's changed it just makes mm -hmm. you much more aware of of what you've had before and from that moment, I could definitely feel that kind of the wind was in my sails because it was like, yeah. oh, this is completely normal. <laughs> like it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Were you kind of aware of what dyslexia was before you were diagnosed with it? Or was it more just a term that you'd, you'd maybe heard of but didn't know an awful lot about? Oh, I didn't know that much about it, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think my friend being dyslexic and really telling me about how it had affected her um gave me you know quite a lot of knowledge but i i was in the same assumptions as everyone else i thought to be dyslexic meant that you um aren't able to spell well or you need to have like a um a special type of paper um yeah. that allows you to see letters um mm -hmm. or that you are not able to read that much and of course there are many dyslexic people who cannot do those things conversely yeah. there are many people who can and I think what I find so fascinating is speaking to people who are also dyslexic who experienced di different um, difficulties when it comes to to language or expressing themselves but also conversely how many people are so brilliant uh, with, like with their dyslexia so for example I know so many great radio broadcasters who are able to succinctly make a great argument but they don't read because the way that they absorb information, they're great at hearing things. And the moment they hear some info, they yeah. lock it in in their memory. And then there are a lot of other people who are like phenomenal photograph uh, uh, photographers or, or um, uh, sort of problem solvers because they're able to use maps well and the visual skills are top, top notch, but they can't write. So it's, so it's like, this is the thing. I, I'm a bit of an optimist where I say that if you do have dyslexia, it might mean that you are limited in some ways. So you find some things a bit more of a struggle. But I also think conversely, you have skills that other people just cannot do yeah. and that you actually are better than quite a lot of people. And it's having somebody tell you, because the big changing point for me, somebody saying, OK, Scott, because you get an assessment after you get told you're a dyslexic. Somebody saying, these are the things you're not good at. And these are the things you're good at was like, OK, I'll just ignore the things I'm rubbish at. And focus on the <laughs> <laughs> <That's my thing. laughs> there you And when you were at school, was it was it an enjoyable place for you? Obviously, you don't have to just say that because I'm a teacher. You don't have to do that. <laughs> it was, was, was school an enjoyable time in your life? Yeah, I think so. I think um, I was very academic and then I think when I wasn't able to get the academic grades I, I wanted I found that really really frustrating and I think I had a lot of issues about my self-worth and a lot of issues with just general anxiety mm -hmm. and I think that because I had not yet been diagnosed as being dyslexic and my grades were lower than I thought that yes. they would be I took that on quite hard um and it became a real frustration and I think it's only sort of later that I realized that it's good to put pressure on yourself a little bit you know like that motivation to keep you going yeah, yeah. and such but you can also conversely put too much on yourself that means that a win or a success in your head you think that's not a success you know like you can become yeah, quite yeah. Careful. so it's a it's a healthy balance and I think it was a little bit maybe not as healthy as I could have been <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you now? Yes, yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Is that so? Obviously, we have um, some pupils in school who have been diagnosed with dyslexia or are potentially getting some uh, literacy profiling to to maybe have that um, test in the future. Have you got any advice for any of our pupils who either have or potentially will have in the future a diagnosis of dyslexia uh, that you'd maybe have some advice to give them? Yeah, certainly. I would say like first things first 
I think you can still do what you want to do in life um, uh, if you have dyslexia or if you later find out that you're dyslexia. I think there can be such an assumption that you can't do the things you want to do because you might not be able to write as, other, uh, as well as other people or um, you might find it a struggle. But I have been actually pleasantly surprised by how much how many people understand um, uh, the challenges you might be facing and, and are willing to help. So for example, you know, I write, sometimes my um, writing style can get a bit muddled, sometimes I make mistakes, sometimes things aren't easily expressed. And I was going into journalism thinking, you know, I really want to be a writer, I really want to express myself, and thinking I can't do it because I'm dyslexic. But actually, being a bit open about it and being a bit upfront and saying, look, I'm dyslexic. If, if I have errors, it's not because I'm sloppy. It's just because of who I am. I've been lucky enough to have understanding people to then, you know, um, give me guidance, help and, and, and still kind of give you a bit of a, a hand. So, so I know that in, in many different jobs, you might be thinking, okay, I can't do that. I reckon that you, you can, it might be harder to get in the initial door because you have to rely on CVs, you have to rely on those awful written applications that I never want to ha have again. So you might need to have help for that. And I just say that, that both being open when you need help and, and asking for, for when you need to is not a sign of weakness. I think I've done it many, 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 many times. And that's been a real um, beneficial for me. And then the, 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 the related point is, if you find out that you are dyslexic or if you are or if you find that that you will do the biggest thing that I had genuinely was having somebody telling me what my strengths and weaknesses are you, you should have at one point a report or even from a teacher to say you know, your difficulties are in um, uh, yeah, writing or spelling or you find it harder to read but you are good at such and such and such and knowing where your strengths are and trying to find a way or, or with your strengths to use that to your advantage is just the biggest thing that I could recommend. But also there are, work, there are ways around counter your weaknesses. So, for example, I can't read that much. I still can't. But I realized quite early on that if I heard the text instead, it goes in. So I was able to get around the reading block by getting some software on my computer that literally that yells at me badly for an awful robotic voice all the <laughs> words that I'm supposed to be reading and then I'm able to hear it so like there, there's always ways technology is a wonderful thing yeah 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 totally and uh being part of the Inspire team this year I'm, I'm fully aware of the, the power of the iPad in terms of the accessibility features on there uh, you're obviously saying about um reading and you find uh reading text uh, from say a book or something quite quite difficult and you listen to things more do you use aud audiobooks quite a lot all the time, all the time, which is why I'm, I'm a big endorser of if you are um, working in the audio industry, have a good narrator. Because if, <laughs> if they've got a boring voice and it's like, oh, I've got to listen to this for 14 hours. That's lovely. <laughs> that, that's, that's great. But yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and also um, podcasts as well have been my saviour because if you're trying to learn a subject and quickly, there is a podcast on legitimately everything that's ever happened. So it's a good way, I think, in terms of revising, is if you've got to learn a particular subject, there's, there's a, a lot of resources that you can use. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got we've got our own school podcast that our Primary Sevens publish every fortnight. So they're, they're oh, wicked. Podcast world, which is great. Obviously, you now make a living out of words, either in uh, print or in, in audio, um, for other people to, to read or listen to. So does your dyslexia affect you or does it inspire you in your kind of job that you have just now? Um, I'd say it doesn't affect me too much. I think I got into this work because, and it's a very obvious thing to say, but so much of TV is so visual. So it, you know, it doesn't rely upon me reading that much about it. Um, I realised that I just m find a way that works for me. So, for example, if I make notes for a review that I'm about to give on the radio, or if it's something to maybe write down later, I write notes, but genuinely they will only make sense to me because yeah. it's my only way of working. And I realised that actually when you leave school, when you're not being marked for everything, so long as you can understand what you're trying to do and mm -hmm. it's not going to be 
you know shared sort of to other people it's it, it doesn't have to perfectly make sense <laughs> you, know, you can just, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can just yeah. convey it in that way and I find that really helpful and then and then I just sort of find that that um sometimes when I express myself I I use not like clumsy like really either bad me- metaphors or words get kind of glued together that don't really make sense in the English language I can't think of any right now but there have been many that that some friends to me or or, or listeners go is wait d- does that make sense etc cetera, etc cetera. and then I've always been a bit like well that's just the way my head works sometimes I use sentences and words like you know when you're when you're talking it doesn't have to be perfect every single time and and I think just kind of disclosing publicly I've, I made it quite early on in my career to be like you know I I'm um, I'm quite proud to be dyslexic and I say that I'm dyslexic partially to kind of help change people's kind of stereotype of what a dyslexia uh, what what dyslexia is but also as a kind of a method to say look I'm not going to be perfect here but I'm trying and I think that 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 is just a, a really uh, beneficial thing that I think I found um, but also like when it just comes down to 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 writing I just always send a draft of what I've written to um, a friend or um, my parents sometimes and they kind of have a brief look if it's something big but like a lot of the time it, um, it still gets um, approved by editors now I still get to send it to editors along with a note if they don't know what I'm like but yeah I'd say that I think what happens is when you go into your careers you will choose something you're passionate and interested by but also if you are dyslexic you will find a way of working that is very specific to you because it, it's your own self there's no cookie cutter way of mm-hmm. having your career if you don't know uh, say if you are um there's there's no cookie cutter uh, model for all d- dyslexics you just make your way of working according to how best it suits you yeah great stuff i uh- Obviously, TV critic, what would you say are the perks of your job? I can imagine that you're able to watch TV shows before the rest of yeah, us. Yeah, sometimes. That, is the biggest perk or is the other ones? Um, I'd say, um, yes, I get previews of shows before they're out, which is which is good and bad because, like... Spoilers. Well, yeah, but also because you just see this show that everyone's excited by and then you watch it and then you're like, yeah, I've watched it. And you can't tell anybody yeah. about it because everyone will get annoyed if you say, well, that person dies. Well, that person dies. <laughs> you have to then say, like, um, good and then say them. There were quite a lot of um, previews as well um, where there's you no know, celebrities if there's a big screening of a show with an actor on. And then um, there's a press conference afterwards. And all I want to be like is, is kind of put my hand up and yell like, you know, you're great, we love you. But then I go, no, actually, I'm working. I have to come up with a question. Like, yeah. that's not a story. Yeah, like, me going to really, <laughs> yeah you know, that's me saying you're great is not going to get me a good headline. So so I think sometimes you have to be like, I'm a, a professional. I know what I'm doing. When actually the little kid inside me is still really excited. Yeah. I think those are the two perks. Very good. I know you did the Bake Off uh, live blog in The Guardian. How far oh. ahead are you with Bake Off? Obviously, you can't oh. tell us. Oh, how many weeks ahead are you? No, 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 no. I'm actually up, up, up to date with that one. So it's, it, oh, it's yes. Michael. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm funny, okay. No, no, no. It's, it's Michael and I at the same time. And um, um, it, it's, it's great. It's, it's pure panic when we put that together. Because <laughs> it's going out Lovely. Right. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Right, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, Scott. You've been fantastic this morning. Just to finish off with something uh, a bit fun. What is your current favourite TV show? And when you were in primary school, what were your favourite show or shows back then? <laughs> oh, I'd say starting when I was younger, I loved the Demon Headmaster. I know they fought it back. And, yeah. But like, like getting completely and utterly traumatised, I think is like a vital step in being someone young watching TV. And for me, that was the show. And then probably now, like... I'm really into crime dramas and police dramas. And there's one called Show Trial on BBC One at the moment that I've really been enjoying. There's a few other shows that I want a bit later, like Succession, that I might not recommend your people to watch <laughs> just yet. But yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like, don't, don't watch great. it, don't watch it. <laughs> but yeah, like 
I mean, the, the good thing is, is that we are in a golden age of TV. Like it is never been so exciting. Like there's so many Netflix shows on at the moment, new rivals popping up all the time. And I think it's just a really exciting time to um, to be watching TV because there's a lot of new storytelling from people we've never seen before. And that's just, I think that's just great. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time, Scott. We'll, uh, we'll finish there. We'll have a big round of applause from our tweet back people who are uh, watching this. And we'll say thank you so much for your time. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me along. It's been lovely. Thank you.